Hey guys, I'm RNG Gamer. I play all my games randomly. Everybody has been saying that Atari 50, the anniversary celebration, is like the best compilation ever. But is it really though? <laughs> We're gonna go through all 104 games on this compilation. That includes the hidden games and the extra features. We're gonna go through everything and we're gonna go through it in order just the way it appears on this, more or less. And I already know what you're gonna say. But RNG Gamer, you're too young and youthful to know anything about these old games. And all I can say to you is, you're absolutely right. Except for the not knowing anything about these games part. <laughs> Look at all this stuff. This is just the stuff I own that's on the Atari 50 compilation. <laughs> I've, I've played a little bit of it. I'm not taking into account any nostalgia. I'm not worried about how your memory or my memory of playing these games in the arcade or on the 2600 or the 5200 or the 7800 or the Jaguar or the Atari computers comes into play. All I'm concerned with is how they play on this compilation on the PlayStation 5 with a modern controller on the TV today. So let's dive right in and do this. Unlike most compilations, everything on Atari 50 is set up on a timeline where you explore the history of Atari, their games along the way, and it's really more like an interactive documentary. You know what the Atari motto is? Innovative leisure. Just the way it is laid out feels like you're going through the whole history of the company and it's really interesting. There's tons of interviews, videos, newspaper articles, things like that, and you get to play the games along the way. And it feels like you're growing along with the company, just the way they grew in the past. Atari started off with arcade games, so that's what we're gonna start with. Pong, 1972, arcade. This wasn't the first video game, but it was the first video game that really seemed to matter. <laughs> it's really just video game tennis. What you see is what you get. Anybody that's played this before knows what's up with Pong. I have to say on this compilation, it's a bit hard to play with the analog sticks. You really need like a spinner style paddle controller. Just hitting it in this version is really tough. And I have to say, while it's very influential, it's not that great. Four out of 10. Quadra Tank, 1978, reimagined in 2022, arcade. This is just a multiplayer version of combat with four players. Rocket. It has tank controls and power-ups to add a little bit of variance to the game, but it's not that great as well. It's more fun with four people. And this gameplay footage, I played it solo, but I did play it later with my daughter, and it was okay. Five out of 10. Breakout, 1976, arcade. When you think about it, Breakout's really just single screen Pong where you're breaking blocks at the top of the screen. And just like Pong before, this really, really, really needs paddle controls. Playing this with the analog stick is no good. It is not fun. It's hard to control. You can see in the gameplay, I'm doing really terribly and I'm fairly good at this game. Still, it's very influential and it still does hold up okay. It's, it's worth your time for a little bit. Five out of 10. Neo Breakout, 2022, only released on this compilation. So this is a modern take on Breakout and it plays much better with the analog sticks, but it's still much too slow. Or at least I thought it was until I realized you could adjust the sensitivity and I recommend turning it up all the way. <laughs> Otherwise you're gonna have a hard time getting the paddle across the screen. There's also a competitive mode where you're in Pong orientation and you're trying to push the wall towards your opponent. It's a lot of fun. The computer is very ruthless, but I had a good time playing against my daughter. My complaint with this is that the block breaking animations can make it hard to see your ball, especially if the blocks you break are white and the little fragments you see falling down are also white. It can really obscure what you're trying to do. Still, this is pretty fun and I'm glad it's included on the compilation. Six out of 10. Sprint 8, 1977, arcade. So this is like an eight player multiplayer game. It seems really crazy. Basically eight people stood around a, a cocktail table playing this, which seems really cool. Unfortunately, back then they all had steering wheels and these days you have to use the terrible analog sticks again. It basically drives like RC Pro-Am 
and you feel like you're driving an RC car. The way you turn is not based on what you're looking at, but rather the way your car is facing. Also, you have a gear shift and you can shift from high to low. But <laughs> if you get too fast, you spin out and crash. You touch a wall, you crash. Touch another car, crash. I'm sure if you were sitting around with your seven friends, had a few drinks, this would be a lot of fun to play. But playing it by yourself against the computer using these analog sticks is a literal nightmare, and I did not have a good time doing it. It's very frustrating. Three out of ten. Fire truck. 1978 Arcade. This is a two-player co-op game where one person steers the front half of a fire truck and the other person steers the rear. <laughs> it's so hard to play by yourself. It drives like Sprint 8, but the back half of your truck just kind of like jerks around. And honestly, on this compilation, I couldn't really find a good way to steer it by myself. I found it to be very frustrating, and even though I got a really good score according to the game, I never felt like I had full control of the fire truck or really even knew what I was doing. I would avoid this one. It's not one of Atari's better games. 3 out of 10. Super Breakout, 1978, Arcade. This is just a better version of the original Breakout from 1976. It plays much better here, but it's still not great without a paddle controller. Using the analog sticks once again is very challenging. This time around, there are three different modes to change up the gameplay, and it adds a lot of variance to the game. It makes it a lot more fun. I think this is a pretty decent game. And if you haven't played it before, it's worth your time. Six out of ten. Lunar Lander, 1979, Arcade. This is Atari's first vector style game. I'm not gonna get into the difference between vector and raster style graphics, but you should be able to tell just from seeing this compared to the last game. The entire gameplay is really physics based and you're just trying to land your module as carefully as possible while conserving your fuel. You get to keep trying to land until your fuel runs out. So there really aren't any lives to speak of in this game. However, I was never able to land more than about three times on a single credit. I don't know what the record is out there, but I don't think it's much better than that. <laughs> Not to toot my own horn, but I think three was pretty good on a single quarter. I'd like to know more about this. Still, Lunar Lander is a classic game, and it's still kind of fun today, but you're not going to want to spend a lot of time with it. It gets old pretty quickly. Five out of ten. VCTR, SCTR, 2022. Only available on this compilation. You're basically playing Lunar Lander, Asteroids, Tempest, and more like in sequence. <laughs> and each one of those is like a stage. And it keeps getting harder and harder and it's more challenging. It plays extremely well on the PS5 and it looks great to boot. I have very little bad to say about this. It even has a two player mode and a single player tethered mode where you're controlling both ships at once, which is really cool and a lot of fun. This is really a highlight of the compilation, and I can't recommend it highly enough. 8 out of 10. Touch Me, 1979, Handheld. This is just the game Simon that we've all played a million times. You basically just have to remember the pattern of colors and see how many you can remember in a row to try to get a high score. Atari was going to put this out before they got scooped by the company that actually put the game out. There's a lot of history on this, on this compilation, and it's really fascinating to figure out how Atari lost so much money because they didn't put this game out in time. 6 out of 10. Asteroids, 1979, Arcade. This is a bona fide classic and probably Atari's most famous game. Definitely their most famous arcade game. It uses the same setup as Lunar Lander, but it's turned into a physics-based shooter. And it plays pretty well in this compilation, I have to say. You have to shoot the asteroids, and as they get hit, they segment into smaller and smaller pieces, and you eventually try to clear them all off the screen before moving to the next level. The music in Asteroids, if you've never heard it, is super intense, and the game is extremely anxiety-inducing. <laughs> Still, Asteroids holds up well, and there's a reason it's a classic. Probably one of the best games on this compilation thus far that Atari put out themselves. 7 out of 10. Missile Command, 1980, Arcade. 
Don't let the Cold War get you down. Shoot those nukes out of the sky. <laughs> This game is famous. You have basically nukes flying in from the top of the screen and you have to shoot up with anti-ballistic missiles to destroy them before they crash into all your bases. Originally, I believe this is played with a trackball at the arcade, but once again, you're playing it with the analog stick here and it is really hard to control. Just like a lot of these other games, it just doesn't feel right. I also hate in this game how you have limited ammo and it never really feels like it's quite enough. I want to go crazy and just like blanket the screen with explosions, but it doesn't want you to do that. It wants you to conserve your ammo, which I don't agree with, by God. If this is really the Cold War, man, we need to blast them out of the sky. <laughs> Still, it's a lot of fun. Even today, it holds up with these bad controls on this compilation. It's a 6 out of 10. Asteroids Deluxe, 1981, Arcade. This has the same gameplay as normal Asteroids, but this time around you have a shield. There's a new background and new enemies and a much higher challenge. While it adds more, I don't think it's any more fun than the original Asteroids. 7 out of 10. Warlords, 1981, Arcade. This is just really four-player breakout. You can see a theme here of Atari like recycling their ideas over and over again, <laughs> which I think is why everybody got burned out. What you do is you're trying to guard your castle in one of the corners while bouncing the ball off and destroying your opponent's castle walls. I will say this, the CP in this is freaking ruthless and plays far beyond the abilities of a real human. <laughs> It's really just a quarter muncher. This game was designed to steal your money, which most arcades were. Once again, this game was played with a paddle controller on the arcade, and it's, once again, super tricky to control with the analog stick. It's way more fun playing with your friends, especially when you're all terrible at it. Playing against the computer is not nearly as fun. This one I have a lot of experience with. I'll give it two scores. Playing it with your friends, eight out of 10. Playing it alone against the computer or against somebody who's really good, 6 out of 10. Centipede, 1981, Arcade. This is a single screen shmup where you're shooting at a segmenting centipede that careens down from the top of the screen. It's a classic game that really does hold up. And while the game does use a trackball in the arcade, the analog stick works pretty well here, and it feels almost as good as the real thing. My 10-year-old cousins played this and got addicted to it. They could not stop playing it. That really says a lot for a game that's like, you know, over 40 years old. 8 out of 10. Tempest, 1981, Arcade. This is a really great tunnel shooter that was, I think, Atari's first vector game with color. You basically just rotate around the perimeter of this tunnel while shooting enemies and avoiding bullets like any other shooter, but being set on different geometric shapes that you kind of rotate around in a 360 degree orientation is very novel and a lot of fun. This one I will say used a spinner wheel in the arcade and that thing spun like a fidget spinner. It spun really quickly. You don't get that same experience with the analog stick once again, and the analog stick is fairly awkward, luckily. They let you use the D-pad, which works a lot better. Sadly, it's not as precise, and landing on the exact spot you want to is nearly impossible. It feels like the slightest tap moves you at least two segments, and it can be really hard to line up your shot at times. Still, even with these problems, while it's not as good as the arcade, it's still really good on this compilation. 7 out of 10. Maze Invaders, 1981 unreleased arcade. As far as I know, this is really the only way to play this unless you have like a ROM from the prototype. This is a very strange game. It's like a mixture of Night Stalker and Pac-Man. You can move freely and shoot in any direction, but the level's maze is constantly moving and blocking your way. You have to collect all the fruit on the screen to open a door and then exit through it to clear the level and then, you know, score bonus points. It's really good, and I wonder why this game was never released. We're super lucky that we get to play it here. I feel like if this was released, it would have been considered one of Atari's best arcade games from the time period. I'm shocked. 8 out of 10. Space Duel, 1982. 
Arcade. This is honestly just a colorized combination of asteroids and fire truck. <laughs> you can play it co-op or linked together. It looks really impressive compared to, you know, the earlier versions of asteroids. But the gimmick of being, like, tethered together is ultra super lame. But two-player co-op for asteroids is really cool. Sadly, playing it solo, it doesn't really do anything new. If you can find somebody to play it with, it's a 7 out of 10. Gravatar, 1982, arcade. I freaking hate Gravatar. <laughs> I've never enjoyed playing this game. I don't know what superhuman out there has the ability to be good at this, but I would love to meet them because it is flipping hard. It's the hardest game on this compilation by far. It's a combination of lunar lander and asteroids, and you fly to different planets to complete missions by destroying enemy bases. But it has the precise fuel consumption and tricky physics from lunar lander that make it almost impossible. Lunar lander, at least you're just going in one direction, down. And this, physics causes you to smash into walls, careen towards the ground and crash. It is so hard to control. And I honestly have to say that I think Gravatar is one of the hardest games to control that I've ever seen. And it makes me furious trying to play this. I've never gotten good at it. And I don't think if I spent 100 hours with it, I would get any better. 4 out of 10. Millipede. 1982. Arcade. This is touted as the sequel to Centipede, but really, it's just Centipede Deluxe. It plays just like Centipede, but with more annoying crap going on and attacking you at the bottom of the screen. There are DDT bags at the top of the screen that you can shoot to basically nuke anything that comes in contact with it. But you have to time it right, which does add some strategy to the game. However, I feel like in this arcade version, it's just more of the same. Come to find out, if you look at the documentation that this compilation includes with this, Internal memos actually call this game Centipede Deluxe. <laughs> I don't think it's quite as good as Centipede, at least not on the arcade version. 7 out of 10. Liberator, 1982. Arcade. This game plays like Reverse Missile Command. You essentially have to liberate, quote unquote, a planet by shooting down the hostile enemy bases, missiles, spaceships, and stuff from like a bird's eye view of the planet. There's unlimited ammo this time, thankfully, and the enemies are trying to constantly destroy your turrets. There's a lot to keep track of, but it's one of the best Atari games thus far. It's also one of the hardest. <laughs> it's really, really cool, and I enjoy this game a lot. I think it's better than Missile Command and honestly just puts it to shame. 9 out of 10. Quantum, 1982. Arcade. This is a flippin' hidden gem of a game if I've ever seen one. It's really interesting, and basically what you have to do is circle the enemies with a trackball to destroy them. You're using an analog stick here, but it works really well. If you run into anything with your cursor, you die. I think this game is a blast to play. I've never played it before, or never even really heard of it until this compilation, and I don't know what everybody's missing, because this game's great. 8 out of 10. Aka R. 1982, unreleased arcade game. This is a strange game. You're basically a turret in the center of the screen and you're like inundated from enemies from all directions. If you shoot a zone, it kills all the enemies inside of it. So you're not aiming at the enemies directly. Also, the enemies are trying to invade your space in the center. And if they do, you switch to like a zoomed in view and you have to shoot the bad guys with your machine gun before they break down the armor and kill you. So it's almost like a reverse, I don't even know how to put it, like breakout, twin stick shooter, tower defense game, something like that. It's very strange. I can see why it was unreleased because it would have been hard to just kind of pick this up in an arcade and figure out what was going on. Still, it's a pretty fun game. I'm hoping the new PS5 remake is better though. 6 out of 10. Black Widow, 1983. Arcade. This was only sold as a conversion kit for Gravitar machines. Thank God, because the less Gravitar machines out there, the better. <laughs> 
So you're a spider in a web, and you do basically what all spiders do. You shoot stars at bugs and collect as much money as possible. <laughs> I thought that was a really good joke. I hope you guys like that. <laughs> this is just a twin stick shooter. We play lots of twin stick shooters today, and this one's actually a really good one. It's fast and hectic, and it works great with the two analog sticks, and I had a lot of fun with it. I wouldn't mind having this as an arcade machine, and I would probably spend a fair amount of time with it, honestly. 8 out of 10. Food Fight. 1983. Arcade. This is the first Atari game with a real mascot. You're a little boy and you have to move across the screen and grab an ice cream cone to advance to the next level. And you have these shifts and pitfalls that you have to avoid all along the way. You can grab the food you encounter along the way and throw it to eliminate the shifts. But I have to say, when I first tried this, I thought this game was freaking impossible. The shifts come at you too fast, they rarely miss, aiming is really tough. But then, I just learned, just keep moving. Don't stop, don't try to kill the chefs, just beeline straight for the freaking ice cream cone and only kill stuff that's in your way, and the game got a lot more fun after I figured that out. It went from being like an impossible and terrible game to being pretty decent. I have to recommend this one, guys, even with the terrible mascot. 7 out of 10. Crystal Castles, 1983, Arcade. Another mascot game and another flipping trackball game. I have to say, this game must have exploded some people's minds when it came out because of the graphics. It looks unbelievable. And the fact that it came out in 1983 is even more unbelievable, especially when you compare it against Food Fight. <laughs> really, it's just a kind of a mixture of Pac-Man and Marbled Madness. You zip around these isometric levels trying to grab the red dots before the enemies. And there are these cool multi-layered environments, and each one looks really unique and makes the level stand out. The problem is that this game controls like garbage, especially with the analog stick. Now, I've never played it before using the trackball, but I don't imagine it's much better. It might even be better with the analog stick, who's to say? But just moving around is a big chore, and I feel like this game would be twice as good if it ran half as fast. The issue comes with when you go down the different paths, there's like wiggle room between the walls and you can miss the red dots. I wish the game was more like Pac-Man, where once you went down a path, you just grabbed all the dots you came in contact with. Still, it's not a terrible game. 6 out of 10. Major Havoc, 1983. Arcade. This is an interesting mashup of genres. It starts as a single screen shmup similar to Galaga, but if it had a baby with Axelay on the Super Nintendo. After that, it goes into a Lunar Lander style segment before turning into a platformer. You have to work your way through a maze to set a bomb on the reactor core and then escape before the timer runs out. This is all fine and dandy, except that the platforming section's controls are so bad that it makes the game almost unplayable. Nothing behaves like you would expect. You move too quickly or too slowly. You jump too high or too low. Just getting a grasp of what's actually happening is like an impossible task. Also, the bullets in the shooter section don't come straight down. They twist at the bottom of the screen, which makes them really difficult to dodge. This game could have been incredible with better controls, maybe one of the best arcade games that Atari ever did. As it sits though, it's a five out of 10. Cloak and Dagger, 1984, Arcade. This was Atari's first movie tie-in game. True to the movie and game's title, this game was only offered as a conversion kit for games made by Atari's competitors, specifically Joust and Defender. It's very shady of you, Atari, very clandestine, very haha, -ha, cloak and dagger. Honestly, I feel bad for anyone that did the conversion because Joust and Defender are way better games than Cloak and Dagger. If you, if you converted your arcade cabinet, I'm sorry. Firstly, this game has music and cutscenes, which we haven't really seen in any of the games prior to this, so that's really cool. The way it works is you basically have to sneak through the enemy base while stealing, you know, whatever isn't nailed down. And you have to cross the room to the exit before the security guards see you. You have a gun, but it's pretty useless as its range is like three feet and the security guards all have dead aim and can shoot you from 60 feet away. It's decent, but the cutscenes, I have to say, as cool as they are, they really slow down the action having to watch them between every level 
takes a lot of time. As a matter of fact, I think the cutscenes are longer than the gameplay itself. Six out of ten. iRobot, 1984, arcade. This is Atari's last arcade game and the first arcade game to use polygon graphics. This is actually really an interesting game. It starts off as a platformer where you have to walk over all the red blocks and turn them blue, kind of like in Cubert. There are obstacles that you have to shoot and this giant eye of Sauron that is watching you and will kill you instantly if it sees you while you're jumping. After all the blocks are blue, you clear the level and you go into a cool like tunnel shmup section that's a lot of fun. Honestly, I was surprised at how good it, this game really is and just downright impressive. I think that Atari's on the right course with this style of game, and if they had continued in the arcade scene, I think they could have come up with some really cool stuff. 8 out of 10. Combat, 1977, the 2600. This is the first console game we're doing so far. This is the packing game with the 2600, and it's multiplayer only. It's also the game that Quadra Tank is based off of. That's a game we covered earlier in this video. Combat is definitely the most common and famous 2600 game. Every person that knows of a 2600 knows of Combat. And if you've ever played a 2600, most likely you've played Combat. You have tank controls and you're just trying to shoot your opponent over a series of different maps. I've played this a million times. And although you can't really see it here, it's still pretty fun with a friend. I played it with my daughter, however, I had already recorded this solo gameplay. You'll just have to trust me. There are also 27 variations where you can play as planes and stuff and all kinds of different scenarios. It's a lot of fun if you have somebody to play with. It's a 6 out of 10. Air Sea Battle, 1977. 2600. This has some single player modes and the 27 different game variations. You're an anti-aircraft gunner and you have to shoot down more planes than your opponent. Whether that being a friend, if you have one, hopefully you do, <laughs> or the AI computer. It's a very simple game, there's not much to it, and you get bored of it really quickly. 5 out of 10. Surround, 1977, 2600. It's basically Snake, but not the snake where you eat apples and get progressively longer, unfortunately. Instead, it's the snake where you try to cut off your opponent and make them crash, like the game Tron, or the game they play in the movie Tron. It gets boring really quickly. Unlike most of the other Atari games, the AI in this one's really dumb, and it's really easy to win almost every single time. 4 out of 10. Outlaw, 1978, 2600. The single player in this only centers around how long it takes to shoot a target 10 times. That, that's what you get. It's really boring. In two player, you have a Wild West showdown. It's also extremely boring. I do not recommend this game. And although it's a very famous Atari game, it's pretty terrible. Three out of 10. Canyon Bomber, 1979, 2600. This is like reverse breakout where you drop bombs on blocks in a canyon. You can't steer, you can't speed up or slow down. You just press a button. It's also not about clearing the blocks. Instead, it's about scoring more points than your opponent. There's also a version of depth charge where you set your depth with the yellow line and then drop bombs on the ships and it'll only hit them if your depth is correct. Honestly, this whole package is really just a timing game and it's not even a good one at that. I find this to be really miserable and one of the worst 2600 games I've ever played. 2 out of 10. 3D Tic-Tac-Toe, 1978, 2600. This is exactly what it sounds like. You're playing Tic-Tac-Toe in a 3D environment. You can win by scoring across the X-axis, the Y-axis, or even the Z-axis, and even at an angle. It's not very much fun. It's very slow to play. Maybe it's more fun playing with somebody else. I'm not sure. No one's going to play this game if they have the choice. 2 out of 10. Adventure, 1980, 2600. This is the first adventure game where you basically explore areas and use items to progress. You explore around and try to find keys to unlock various castles. There are dragons and bats that get in your way and try to impede your progress. Basically what you have to do is find the golden chalice and return it to the yellow castle. 
This is a really fun game, and I believe was the first game to ever really have an Easter egg in it, <laughs> which is which is interesting. The creator hid his name in the game if you do a series of tasks. But this is a lot of fun, and finding all the different keys to unlock the different castles, to find the items to carry here and there, it's the same thing we go through when we play Resident Evil these days, or any other adventure game, and this is really the first one. It's still a lot of fun, and I liked it a lot. 8 out of 10. Dodge them. 1980-2600. You speed around a track while collecting the dots. You can change lanes in the intersections and try to avoid the other driver who's trying to collide with you. They're doing everything they can in their power to hit you, and it's super annoying. You can speed up by pressing the button on the controller. And there are many different versions of this on several different consoles from this generation, and I suck at like every single one of them. I find this game to be incredibly frustrating, and I will never get very good at this game. I do not like it. It's too tense. It's too hard. I don't know what kind of person enjoys this, but it's not me. If you like it, leave it in the comments. <laughs> Three out of ten. Missile Command, 1981, 2600. This is the port of the arcade game I showed earlier. And this is the best-selling game on the 2600 when it came out. Rob Fulop, the programmer of this game, expected to get a big bonus. Like I said, he made the best-selling game on the console. And instead, he got a coupon for a free turkey. <laughs> After that, he quit Atari. I have to say, this plays even better here than on the real 2600. And it's a lot more fun than the arcade version, too. Although it doesn't look as good, it is... Way more fun to play. 7 out of 10. Warlords, 1981, 2600. This, again, is the port of the arcade game I showed earlier. This one is not nearly as good as the arcade version, and it really, really, really needs to be played with a paddle controller. If you're playing it on the 2600, you have a paddle controller. It came with the console. However, playing it with the analog stick here is really hard, and once again, the AI is ruthless. 4 out of 10. Asteroids, 1981, 2600. This plays exactly like the arcade game, but it's in color now. One of the few examples of the 2600 version having something graphically better than the arcade. It's still a fun game, and it works really well with the D-pad on the PS5 controller. I do have to give them props for that. This game has a huge flaw. The asteroids always move in this predictable, like, curtain pattern that's easy to exploit. I feel like once you get the pattern down on this, you can just play the game forever without ever losing and just rack up, like, an infinity high score. It's worse than the arcade game for sure, but at least it has 66 freaking variations on the cart. There's 66 versions of this you can try. I don't know why anybody would play anything other than just the standard one-player arcade version, but... If you want to, they're there for you. 6 out of 10. Breakout. 1978. 2600. This is a hidden game on this compilation. It's a port of the arcade game, but the controls are even worse than the arcade version here without the paddle controller. Using the analog stick or the D-pad on the PS5 is no good. It is does not play well. The ball physics are also super erratic and hard to predict. This game just feels slippery. That's the only way I can describe it, and I would steer clear of this one. 4 out of 10. Super Breakout, 1981, 2600. This plays just like Super Breakout in the arcade, but once again, it's miserable without a paddle controller, and it's not nearly as good. It's better than Breakout on the 2600, but just a little bit. 5 out of 10. Combat 2, 2600. Unreleased Prototype. This is another hidden game in the compilation. It's two-player only. It's just the tank part of the original combat game we covered earlier, but with obstacles, three hit deaths, worse controls. There's a reason they didn't release this game. I did try playing it with my daughter later. It's not as much fun as the original combat. It's kind of good that they didn't release it. My daughter agreed. <laughs> three out of ten. Haunted House, 1982, 2600. This is considered to be the forerunner to survival horror, one of my favorite genres of video games. You're a pair of eyes and you have to explore a mansion looking for the three parts of an urn. Then you have to carry it back to the entrance. 
The mansion has four floors with six rooms each, and the stairs and doors are all randomized. It may require keys that you have to find hidden around the stages. There are a lot of ghosts and tarantulas, etc., that are out to get you. And of course, everything is dark, so you have to use matches to see. And you're graded on the number of matches you use. The basic variation of this game allows you to see the walls and the environments you're in. But the other variations, the more advanced variations, make everything pitch black and you can only really see around your eyes. And I find that to be much less fun. If you could see the walls and the environments on this, I would give this game like an 8 or a 9 out of 10. However, as it is, with most of the versions having this blinding mechanic where you can't see what you're doing, that makes it a 6 out of 10. Yars Revenge, 1982, 2600. This is one of the most creative and beloved games on the 2600. And as far as I know, it's the first game that had a backstory and the first game to really credit the designer. It's kind of hard to figure out how to play this just watching it. And if you don't know how to play, it's pretty confusing. You're basically a bug flying around named Yar. And the enemy is the guy or the thing on the right. He's hidden behind a barrier that you need to shoot apart. After he's exposed, you eat one of the remaining bricks of his wall that charges a laser cannon that you then have to fire at the enemy and hit him. The little block floating around the screen is the enemy's drone that's trying to chase you down. And the static on the left of the screen is the neutral zone. You can't fire from there and it forces you to kind of have to stay close to defeat the enemy. That's sort of a convoluted sort of gaming system for a 2600 game, which is known for its simple games. But once you pick it up, it's a lot of fun. And I think this is one of the better games on the 2600. Eight out of 10. Yars Revenge Enhanced, 2022. This is unique to this compilation, and it plays exactly like the 2600 version we just covered with updated graphics. They claim that the Atari 2600 code is running in the background, and it totally is. You can switch between the updated and the original graphics just by hitting a button. Even though it has updated graphics, I don't think that really elevates the game as much. It plays exactly the same. It's just as fun, but I don't think that the updated graphics really add anything to it. If anything, they take away from the charm of the original. Also, an 8 out of 10. Haunted Houses 2022, unique to this collection. This is a modern spin on the 2600 game we covered just a little while ago. This is really, really difficult and has a very strict time limit. It's also very, very tense. I get more anxious playing this than most legit survival horror games. It's saying a lot that I found this more nerve wracking than playing like Resident Evil 7. <laughs> also, everything is totally randomized and I totally suck at this. I don't like this game. I wish that there was no time limit. That would make it a lot more fun. As it is, I have to say avoid this one. It's supposed to be one of like the main features of this compilation, but I just didn't like it. Four out of 10. Demons to Diamonds, 1982, 2600. This is a gallery shooter where you're trying to shoot spooky stuff and killing enemies leaves behind annoying skulls that kind of block your shots and also shoot at you. I love shooters, and I love single-screen gallery shooters, but this one's not one of the better ones on the 2600. It's really one of the only ones that Atari developed themselves on a console that's known for these, which is surprising. Still as it stands, it's okay. It's not great. It's a 5 out of 10. Basic Math, 1977, 2600. This is a hidden game on the compilation. I'm not sure why they chose this to even be on here, let alone a hidden special game. You just do basic math. Is this even a game? I would say it's not even a game. What do you think? One out of 10. Real Sports Baseball, 1982, 2600. I mean, it looks like baseball and it's pretty advanced for a 2600 game. There's batting, stealing bases, pitching and fielding but the controls are basically backwards from what we would all expect, and the gameplay is super clunky. This is not a fun game to play these days. It does not really hold up well, and you can play a better baseball game on pretty much any other console, even on the 2600. Three out of 10. 
Real Sports Volleyball, 1982, 2600. You control two players, and this is fast-paced and hectic. It's a lot of fun, but it can be a little difficult to tell where the ball is going. It's the shadow doesn't really line up where you'd expect. Still, this is a really fun game, and it kind of reminds me of Pong, but it just plays better and it's more fun even when playing alone. 7 out of 10. Real Sports Football, 1983, 2600. It's five on five football, which isn't really much of a thing unless you're playing in the backyard with your friends. You have both offensive and defensive plays that you can select by pressing a direction on the joystick beforehand. But I have to say, I have a hard time remembering what direction is what play, and I ended up just picking pretty randomly, which made this game very difficult. It also feels like 80% of the plays result in a sack or a loss of yards, and that's even for the AI opponent. This is just not very much fun. And just like I said about baseball, there are plenty of other games you can play that are better, even on the 2600. 4 out of 10. Sword Quest Earth World, 1982, 2600. This is one of the first action adventure games ever made. There are 12 rooms, each tied to a sign of the zodiac. You have to find and place the correct item in each room. Along the way, you may have to complete various mini games or puzzles. This whole game was designed as like a real-life treasure hunt for a real-life piece of treasure. Basically, what you have to do is you have to solve the puzzles in the game, all the mini-games, place everything in the correct room to get like a code that you then correspond to a comic book that was included with the game. And the first person to figure it out and compete in some tournament, I guess they had, got a $25,000 piece of treasure in real life. Very cool. The story behind this is way more interesting than the game itself, and I would recommend checking that, that out. The game, eh, it's like a 6 out of 10. Super Breakout, 1982, 5200. This is the first game on the super failed Atari console that was called the 5200, and this is the pack-in game that came with it. This is the same as all the other versions of Breakout we've covered, but with better graphics. The analog stick still feels like crap. It feels even worse than before, I have to say. I don't think this is even as good as the 2600 version. It looks better, though. Still, it's a worse game. 5 out of 10. Missile Command, 1982. 5200. This plays the same as the other versions, but by far has the worst controls. It is almost unplayable. I know the controller on the 5200 was, like, absolutely terrible, I've never played this on the 5200, but I will tell you, on the PlayStation 5, the freaking analog stick just feels like it does not work. This game is almost unplayable. 3 out of 10. Star Raiders, 1982, 5200. This is a shockingly complex space flight sim with objectives, combat, exploration, and enough controls to like melt your brain. This is originally a PC game, and they've done a good job of making it playable and controllable here, but it's really tough to play on the 5200 proper. I don't know how you even do it. <laughs> I'm surprised it even works. I know it has, like, all these crazy controls and stuff. The, the 5200 had, like, a, uh, a number pad on it, and you had to use all those buttons. The instruction manual on this game feels like a freaking novel, and I've never really been able to get into this game. I know it's not a bad game, and it's relatively fun, but it's just not for me, and it's just too obtuse to get into. 5 out of 10. Centipede, 1983, 2600. Whoa! This one's not a looker at all. <laughs> this looks terrible, but it plays fairly well, though, and I think it's actually harder than the arcade version we've covered earlier. Still, this is a really good version of the game, and I would say this is like a must-have on the 2600. 7 out of 10. Sword Quest Fire World, 1983, 2600. This is the second part to the first Sword Quest game. This time around, you could win a $25,000 golden chalice. Of course, only if you were able to figure out all the puzzles and be the first to submit it and also win the live competition they had. 
it's really just more of the same from the first game. There's cryptic puzzles, frustrating mini games, mazes, and having to search through a comic book for clues. I don't want to do that. This game is also way harder than the first. I think the first one was too easy and they had too many people competing in their competition or whatever. So I think they ramped up the difficulty to get those numbers down. <laughs> While it looks better, it is way more complex. And I do think this is just a straight up worse game. Five out of 10. Quad Run. Quad Run, Quad Run, Quad Run, Quad Run. 1983, 2600. This is the first 2600 game with voices in it. It's also mail order only, so it's like extremely rare and valuable. I don't know how much this goes for, but I've never known of anybody that had it. And I know a lot of people that are looking for it. It's also really strange and really hard. You have to shoot the enemies, but then like catch the bullet as it passes through them. <laughs> and you only have three bullets and it's like game over. At a certain point, you have to tag the enemies on the left and the right. Very confusing and awkward to play, but kind of interesting. I, I'm surprised this one didn't get like an actual release in retail stores. I enjoy my time with it, but it's not great. Six out of 10. Real Sports Soccer, 1983, 2600. This is just three on three with like no goalies and your players can basically loop the screen to teleport ahead of the opponent, which totally breaks the game. Like the game just doesn't work. As far as soccer goes, you have to think of it as something else. Still, it's not bad for what it is, and I kind of had a little bit of fun with it if I just, like, throw all the rules to soccer out the window. <laughs> I would say try it if you can find it around somewhere, but it's still pretty mediocre in the end. 5 out of 10. Real Sports Tennis. 1983. 2600. This looks very impressive graphically, and I have to say, the game controls pretty well, but controlling the direction is dictated by the direction you're moving when you hit the ball and where on your racket it touches. So like if it hits closer towards the player's hand, it'll go to the left. If it hits towards the tip of the racket, it'll go to the right, and that's really difficult to control. That's very precise for what we're doing here on the 2600, guys. It's an impressive mechanic, I have to say, but it is hard to control where the ball goes. Still, I think it's like the best real sports game so far, other than volleyball. Six out of ten. Real sports basketball, 1983. Unreleased prototype on the 2600. This is by far the worst basketball game I've ever played. Ever. Ever. It's two on two and it's basically impossible to control. If you touch an opponent, they take the ball. But you can't take it from them. Also, if you score and take the lead, you can just stand still and the opponent won't do anything. And you can just sit there and run out the clock. So you can finish the game like two to zero. <laughs> if you actually try to play this game, the computer is ruthless. They get a turnover on like three out of four plays. They get almost all the rebounds. They rarely miss a shot. There's a reason this game was never released. It is awful. Three out of 10. Minor 2049er, 1983, the 2600. I own this game, complete in box, and it's pretty pricey and hard to find. It's a puzzle platformer that can best be described as a mixture of Donkey Kong and City Connection and maybe that crappy board game Shoots and Ladders. It starts with a nightmarish rendition of Oh My Darling Clementine by Stephen Foster. And it's like the programmer didn't know certain notes needed to be sharp, so you end up with this strange like modal hellscape of a melody. It's terrible. The way you play is you have to like touch all the floor tiles while platforming over gaps, killing enemies, avoiding mine shafts and slides. And it controls fairly well, but it's very annoying and constantly feels like it's trolling you. When you lose one of your three lives, the game resets all of your progress, which is hair pullingly irritating. I really wanted to like this game, but I really, really, really don't. And I really regret paying so much for it when I bought it in the box. Four out of ten. 
Saboteur, 1984, 2600. Unreleased prototype. As far as I know, this is really the only way to play this unless you find a ROM of it somewhere. This game is bonkers, and it is too complicated for its own good. In phase one, you're in the center of the screen and you have to shoot enemies in like eight directions while this warhead is being built on the right side of the screen. And this part of the game's fine and controls pretty well. Once the warhead is complete, you go into phase two where you have to ricochet your shots off the indestructible enemy that's chasing you and you're trying to get the ricocheted bullets to clear all of the moving blocks at the bottom like a harder version of Breakout. Also, you have to avoid this freaking drone that's flying all around. Also, you have to do it before time runs out. If you do do that, but you won't, trust me, you move on to stage two. I was never able to do it. I spent like a long time working on this and trying to do it and was never able to do it. If time runs out, it's off to phase B of part two, where you have to shoot down the warhead with a single shot while bullets are flying all around from all over the place. Then you get to move on to the next stage. Jeez, guys, man, I don't know what to say. It's very ambitious. And it can even be a little fun, excluding like phase two, of course. But man, I don't know what they were thinking when they made this. Six out of 10, Gravatar, 1983, 2600. This is another hidden game on the compilation, and it's just the 2600 port of the arcade game we covered earlier. Once again, I hate it. I can't play it. I'm awful at it. I don't know who can play this. I'm sure there's a bunch of people that are great at this game. I don't know who they are. I asked all my friends and they all said that this is like the hardest game they've ever played. It plays exactly the same with all the BS mechanics we had before, all the weird physics, all the terrible controls, and I actually think this might be harder than the flippin' arcade game. But, but I have to say this, there is a mode that turns off gravity, and it makes the game a lot, and I mean a lot more fun, but it is still really, really, really hard to control. It's better than the arcade version, but it's also only a 4 out of 10. Sword Quest Waterworld, 1983, 2600. This is the third game in the series. It was sold exclusively through the Atari Club mail order service, and it is very, very rare and very expensive to buy a physical copy of this game, if you can even find a copy of it. It's more of the same. This time you have a chance to win a golden crown allegedly worth $20. $5,000. You have to explore, find items, place them in rooms, uncover clues, scour through the comic book that came with the game to figure out how to progress. I will say this though, the mini games in this version play the best and have the most reasonable challenge out of all the others. I guess because it was a mail order game, they could ramp down the difficulty because there weren't going to be as many people playing in the real life competition they had to get the golden chalice or whatever it was. It's okay. It's the best so far of the Sword Quest games anyway. 6 out of 10. Sword Quest Air World 2022. Only released on this compilation. This never came out back in the day, so no one got the real treasure for the game, which was the Philosopher's Stone for the real prize. And I think like there was, they were also going to give out maybe a sort of ultimate sorcery or something. Those items were made, by the way, guys. Like real treasure that I think sat in the creator's like basement for all these years or something. <laughs> they never gave them away. Anyway, Digital Clips made this game just for the release. So after 40 years, the flipping fourth game was finally put out. And Digital Clips, with all of their knowledge of the past and present, had the ability to create something truly remarkable to bring this game into the modern era. And what did they give us? Freaking Flappy Bird. <laughs> all of the mini games play around the mechanics of Flappy Bird, which I hate. <laughs> The puzzle to solve the riddle is really, really, really tough, and I never would have been able to solve this on my own. It may have taken me like 100 hours or something. Just reading the solution online is like mind-blowing, and the thought of having to go through all this is so off-putting. I really didn't want to do it, and I have to say, guys, I, I gave it a, a good college try, 
but I was like, I don't care enough to even want to do this. I don't really care to figure out the, the ultimate mystery at the end. I gave up on it after spending a couple of hours on it and trying to go through a walkthrough. Ugh. Still, I would say it's about as good as the previous Sword Quest game. It's a 6 out of 10. Millipede, 1984, 2600. Holy crap, we have auto fire in a 2600 game? I have to say, this version of the game plays great. Maybe even better than the arcade, and it is super fun and addictive. It's the same mechanics as before, but all the crazy crap at the bottom seems like manageable this time around and actually makes the game more fun and more enjoyable. I added this to my wish list to like pick up a physical copy of it. That's how much I enjoyed this. 8 out of 10. Millipede. 5200. Unreleased prototype. Double holy crap! This one might even be better than the 2600 version. Unfortunately, I can't pick up a copy of it because, like I said, it never released. The improved graphics come off with a choppier frame rate, but it's still actually really incredible and a lot of fun. 8 out of 10. Crystal Castles, 1984, 2600. I kind of hate this game. <laughs> it's a really basic port of the arcade game we covered earlier. The levels are super simplified over that version, but the controls are just as weird as ever. I said before that the level design of the arcade version is what made it stand out, and with that gone, this game really doesn't have much going for it. Like I said before, it's not like Pac-Man where when you go down a path, you can't miss the pellets. In this game, there's just like this wiggle room inside the path that makes grabbing the pellets a real freaking chore, and I just hate it. I just don't like playing this game. It's a unique idea, but it's just not much fun in my opinion. 4 out of 10. Bounty Bob Strikes Back, 1985, 5200. This is by far the rarest game on the 5200 if you wanted to pick it up. It's also the sequel to Minor 2049er we covered earlier that I did not like. It has the same mechanics as Minor 2049er where you have to touch all of the floor spaces, but the controls are very very, very, very slippery, and it's easy to fall off an edge, which instantly kills you. You need like pinpoint, pixel perfect accuracy with no mistakes to have any sort of chance in this game. The edges of the platform, well, you can't actually touch those. They're just illusions to try to give like a 3D look to it, and you'll fall if you touch the edge of them. It took me 20 minutes of repeated attempts just to beat the first level of this game. I'm not exaggerating. It took forever. It's just as bad as the first game, and I really disliked this. 4 out of 10. Asteroids, 1986, 7800. This is the first 7800 game we've covered. It plays exactly like all the other Asteroid games, but instead of vector graphics, it uses these cool looking sprites. I think it looks great, but it's not any more fun than the other versions of Asteroids. I think they kind of like nailed it the first time and didn't really improve on it in these extra versions we've covered thus far. 7 out of 10. Centipede, 1986, 7800. This is a great version of Centipede, probably the best one so far. It's the same as the rest, but it just seems to feel just a tad better. It controls really well on the PS5. 8 out of 10. Solaris, 1986, 2600. This is considered to be a technical masterpiece for the 2600, which was a very old system at this point. You warp around the solar system getting into dogfights, bombing bases, and completing objectives as you try to clear all the enemies on the overworld grid. I've played this somewhere before on another compilation, but I can't remember where. I really enjoyed it there. I really enjoyed it here. I think this is a great game. I also added it to my wish list to pick up physically. 7 out of 10. Real Sports Boxing, 1987, 2600. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, this is not. It is a button masher to the extreme and has little to no strategy. You just line up with your opponent and push the button faster than they can hit you. It looks impressive for a 2600 game, but it is extremely boring. As long as you press the button faster, you're going to win. 
3 out of 10. Secret Quest, 1989, 2600. Is this Atari's answer to like the Legend of Zelda? You grab a sword and wander around a series of maze-like dungeons? You have to find all of the hidden symbols from around the level and then input them into a computer. This sets a self-destruct sequence and then you have to escape before time runs out. I will admit, this is pretty advanced for a 2600 game and even has like a password save system where you can carry on your progress from before. But this does not hold a candle to The Legend of Zelda, not by a long shot. I do applaud the programmers for trying something different, but there's just not enough going on to really hold your attention. The Atari needs to stick to arcade style games because there's not enough memory to like do much more than that. 5 out of 10. Dark Chambers, 1988, 7800. This is just a straight up clone of Gauntlet. I don't know how they got away with this. I, it, it's just Gauntlet. You wander around dungeons looking for the game's few upgrades and keys for locked doors and then the exit for the game's 26 stages. Each floor is a maze. And you'll be killing tons of enemies and these enemy respawners. It's not nearly as fun as Gauntlet and it can get pretty repetitive and boring. But it's not a bad game at all and it's really playable, especially on the PS5. 6 out of 10. Dark Chambers, 1988, 2600. This came after the 7800 version, which is shocking that a 2600 game came after a 7800 game. But let me tell you, this version is worse in every conceivable way. It's like it's not even the same game. Just navigating around is so much harder and everything is so much more zoomed in and the levels are expansive and don't seem to make much sense. I feel like you need to get out like a graph paper and draw your own maps. And I'm not going to do that. I wasn't going to do that back then. I'm definitely not going to do it now. <laughs> this is one you need to avoid. 4 out of 10. Star Raiders, 1982. Atari 400-800 computer. They couldn't give us the computer version, so they just gave us the 5200 version that we covered again earlier. It's just the same game as before. To refresh, it was a 5 out of 10. Caverns of Mars, 1981. Atari 400 and 800 computer. This is actually the first computer game we're covering so far. And this was actually a homebrew that a fan made and Atari actually published it, which is super cool. Congratulations to that fan. It's really just a descending shmup, and I've never really played anything like it. You have to shoot the fuel tanks to have enough fuel to reach the end of the level. You set a bomb and escape before time runs out. Which seems to be a recurring theme we've seen in other Atari games. The game is fine, but it does feel a little sluggish to play, and it does get a little repetitive. Still, fine enough game, a little mediocre, but it's awesome that a fan made it. 5 out of 10. Minor 2049er, 1982, Atari 800 computer. This is the same gameplay we saw before, but it is much more playable now. You know what the main thing is that ruins these games? The freaking timer. This game would be so much better if it didn't have a timer. I just hate that. Man, what a way to ruin your game. If you ever want to make a game worse, I feel like just add a timer to it to add more tension. So the player can't enjoy the game. You know, they feel like they're rushing through it. Why do you want someone to rush through something you worked so hard on? I just don't get it. 5 out of 10. Bounty Bob Strikes Back, 1985. Atari 800 computer. This is exactly the same game as the 5200 version we covered earlier. Basic jumps feel impossible and it's just as annoying as ever. Stay away from this, just like the other version. 4 out of 10. Food Fight, 1989. Atari XEGS Computer. This is a port of the arcade game we covered earlier. And I can forgive the graphics, but this game has a low frame rate that is choppy as hell. And it makes the game super hard to play. It feels like you're playing like a flip book. <laughs> this is awful, and it is not fun to play at all. I've never played anything else on the Atari XEGS computer, but if this was like the game I got with it, I probably would just give up on that computer right away. 4 out of 10. Yoomp, 2007, Atari XE computer. Holy crap, are you seeing this after the last game? 
This is the same freaking computer. I can't believe it. This is a homebrew from Poland that came out in 2007. And it's amazing that they decided to include it on this compilation. It really showcases the Atari computer's abilities. And if we could do this back in like the late 80s, man, Atari may have like, you know, conquered the home console computer wars. Not only does this game look great, but it is super simple and fun and addictive. It even lets you like continue from where you left off, which is amazing. It's kind of like a rhythm puzzle game where you're just trying to bounce down this tunnel while avoiding the, the pitfalls and also trying to land on certain tiles to give you super jumps and, and other mechanics. It is super fun and I could not get enough of this game. I played it for hours and hours and hours and it may be the best game on this entire compilation. Nine out of 10. Ninja Golf, 1990, 7800. I'm not exactly sure what I was expecting with this game, but it sure wasn't this. <laughs> this game is not nearly as cool as it sounds. The golf portion is basically just, it, it consists of aiming and then just hitting a button when the strength of the shot like is at its maximum. Then you just run to the ball in several screens of like side-scrolling combat that plays like Kung Fu on the NES, but worse. You can grab health and shurikens to help you out. But when you get to the green, instead of like putting, you just face off against a dragon in sort of like a gallery shooter. And it's the same boss on all nine holes. And once you figure out the pattern, like you just win every time. It's a cool idea for, you know, Ninja Golf. I think that's awesome, but it isn't executed very well and it gets boring really, really, really quickly. I know this is like the game to get on the 7800, but I don't know why. Surely there are better games than this on the system, right? Right? Six out of 10. Basket Brawl, 1990, 7800. This is a pretty boring basketball game, despite its name. The basketball portion of the game is just clunky and it doesn't play well. Yeah, you can punch the opposing team, which will cause them to drop the ball. But other than this, there really isn't much to say about this at all. The game claims you can win by knocking out your opponents, but despite my best efforts, I wasn't able to do it. I just spent my whole time punching. I never tried to grab the ball or score a point at all. I just hit the opponents. And I did it like for the duration of the whole game and nobody ever went down. That was really disappointing. This is not a good game. Four out of 10. Fatal Run, 1990, 2600. Guys, this is a retail 2600 game from 1990. 1990, the Sega Genesis was out already. Basically, you're just trying to race across the country and deliver vaccines. Along the way, you have to shoot down other cars and avoid obstacles. And when you reach the end of the level, you get graded on how you did and receive money that you use to repair and upgrade your car. That's pretty sophisticated for a 2600 game. And it has 32 flipping stages. <laughs> it's so many. Although, I will say this, each stage feels pretty much the same. Still, this is a pretty cool game, and I'm really impressed that new Atari games were coming out in like 1990. It does okay and it plays well here. 6 out of 10. Fatal Run, 1990, 7800. Well, it does look better than the 2600 version, but the controls feel more sluggish and I guess unresponsive is the best way to describe it. You can select from multiple weapons this time. The machine gun is back, but you also have missiles, smokescreen, shields, oil slicks. Still, even with the upgrades, this game is like ultra boring. I didn't think it was nearly as fast paced or fun as the 2600 version. One nice bonus is the cutscene at the end of each stage that shows all the people dying because you failed to deliver the vaccine fast enough. That was really uplifting, guys. Thanks for that. <laughs> Five out of ten. Scrapyard Dog. 1991, 7800. This is the only side-scrolling platformer on the 7800. And crap like this is why Atari failed as a company. I'm just gonna come out and say that. 
Shots fired, guys. This is without a doubt the worst controlling platformer I have ever played. You know how like in a Mario game, when you stop, there is this slight sense of inertia where Mario takes like a couple of extra steps? Just a little bit? Now imagine that instead of a couple of steps, it's like half the freaking screen. That's what it feels like to play this game. Also, it takes about two seconds to accelerate to full speed. But the speed is like four times faster than it needs to be. It's like Sonic the Hedgehog speed. When you combine those things together where like you don't speed up fast enough, and when you do accelerate, it's too much, and then you can't stop, it makes controlling this game ultra slippery and a total mess. Also, the music is super repetitive and annoying as hell. I hate it. This whole experience of this game is incredibly painful. And this is one of the worst games on the compilation. 2 out of 10. Scrapyard Dog, 1991. Atari Lynx. This is our first handheld game so far. It's not great, but it's a million times better than the 7800 version. Instead of being too fast and slippery, instead it's like very slow and plodding. The graphics are colorful and the music is tolerable, but it feels like a chore to play this. It's still not a good game. The whole Scrapyard Dog franchise, guys, not great. Sorry if you're a fan, I don't agree with you. <laughs> 4 out of 10. Turbo Sub, 1991, Lynx. This is like a cross between Afterburner and Space Harrier. You start off blasting baddies like out of the sky and it controls pretty well and the enemy design is nice. And after you've taken out enough enemies, you dive underwater where you have to collect gems and avoid like these impossible to dodge obstacles. After clearing the stage, you can buy some upgrades for your ship that make it a lot stronger and make it a lot more fun. And I think this is a really great idea for a game. And if its difficulty were tightened up, it could have been maybe the best game on this compilation. But what really brings it down are those like obstacles and the underwater sections that are impossible to avoid. I wish that worked out. It's almost like they're designed to just heat seek directly into you. Like, I don't know how you avoid them. If you have any tips for me, let me know in the comments, because <laughs> I really want to love this game. It's good enough, well, if that was fixed, it would be good enough to like buy a Lynx console just to play this game. But as it stands, 6 out of 10. Basket Brawl, 1992, Lynx. I mean, I guess it's better than the 7800 version of the game, but it's way more annoying now. It's one-on-one, -on -one, and the combat plays a much bigger role with more weapons and such. But what really brings this game down, and I mean really brings it down, is that the freaking bystanders watching the game can come out onto the court and attack you. <laughs> They're constantly doing it, and it's causing turnovers all the time. It's like maddening to the point of wanting to pull out your hair, and I hate it. Imagine if, like, the people that paid for, like, side court ticket to the basketball game could just run out on the court and just like kick the ball or like punch somebody. I hate it. Occasionally they'll even throw a freaking knife at you. Ugh, so annoying. Five out of 10. Cybermorph, 1993, Atari Jaguar. This is the packing game on the Atari Jaguar. I played this back in the day when I got my first Jaguar on clearance from Walmart and I've played it several times since. This game isn't nearly as bad as everyone says it is. It's supposed to be like Star Fox in a 3D open environment, but it's not at all. Really what you're doing is you're exploring while using your radar to find a set number of crystals per level. And of course there are tons of like annoying enemies around that get in your way and are sometimes carrying the crystals and you have to shoot them down to then collect the crystal. Once you get all the crystals, you can find the exit to the level. The trick to controlling this game is to just lightly tap the accelerator button and then let off. If you hold down on it like you would in a normal racing game, you start crashing around into crap left and right. And that's why people hate this game and you get the, where did you learn how to fly comment. Don't do that. Keep the speed kind of slow and you can maneuver a lot better. Most of the flack that this game gets is that it doesn't look much better than Star Fox and that was on a 16-bit system. And this game's 
you know, allegedly running on a 64-bit system, but it doesn't really show off what the Atari Jaguar can do at all. It was a terrible choice for a pack-in game. It's not as bad as everybody says, but it's still not great. 5 out of 10. Trevor McFur in the Crescent Galaxy, 1993. Jaguar. This is the only shoot 'em up on the Jaguar. I consider myself to be a bit of a shmup connoisseur. It's my favorite genre, and I'm actually fairly decent at them. But I have to say, this is one of the worst shoot 'em ups I've ever played. Maybe the worst. It looks and plays like a student project with backgrounds that were stolen from like low res internet images. The enemy placement is unfair and almost random. Despite the numerous special weapons you get, you always feel underpowered and super easy to kill. Every enemy you shoot breaks apart into smaller pieces like in asteroids, and that would be fine here and there, but it's every freaking enemy in the game. And the way they break apart is unpredictable and erratic, which means positioning your ship is really hard. Sometimes you move in front of an enemy to like shoot them at the last second, and one of the pieces it breaks into hurdles forward and takes you out. This is my first time playing this game, despite the fact that I own it on the Jaguar and it's been in my backlog forever. It was so much worse than I could have ever imagined, guys. I know people said it was bad, but I was like, how bad could it be? Is it just Jaguar bad? Which is pretty bad, but not as terrible as everybody thinks. I was wrong. This game is unbelievably terrible. Like I said, shoot 'em ups are my favorite genre of all time, and I am super bummed that this is the worst game on the entire compilation other than basic math. It doesn't even have any music. I don't know of any redeeming qualities to this game. 2 out of 10. Evolution Dino Dudes, 1993, Jaguar. This is a puzzle platformer, and I was going to say that this feels like an Amiga game, and like a game I've played before, and it turns out it was a flipping Amiga game, and I did play it before on the Genesis, where it's called The Humans. It came out on a bunch of consoles where it's titled The Humans, but for some reason, they changed it on the Jaguar. This reminds me a bit of Lemmings, and you need to use like all the abilities and items that you have at your disposal to kind of like work your way through the level and reach the objective at the end. It plays fine, but shuffling through the various abilities and using them on the console is clunky, and it just works better on the PC. All games like this work better on the PC. You know, I've never been a big fan of this style of game, and Dino Dude certainly isn't going to like change that. I think it's okay, and these games can be fine sometimes, but this is not one of the better ones I've played, and I feel like Lemmings just works better. It's much more appealing than the Cavemen, obviously. 5 out of 10. Malibu Bikini Volleyball, 1993, Lynx. Dude, what the hell? You're supposed to be, I mean, what? First of all, you're playing as a bunch of dudes. I thought this was supposed to be like bikini volleyball. It's just guys. Secondly, if you're gonna have a volleyball game, don't make it where when you get served to, your players are hidden off screen. I can't tell where the freaking serve is going, and I can't see where my players are, and I don't have time to react. This is really, really, really hard to control. Trying to line up with the ball feels next to impossible. Like, you don't... I would think you could, like, put your body near the shadow of where the ball is going to be, but no, like, you need to be slightly below the shadow in your hands... Not where they are while you're moving, but when you decide to hit the ball where your hands are going to be, you position them slightly below the shadow. It's so hard. I can't even like describe what it's like to play this. I can't even do it. Even the computer can't line up their shots. The computer misses the ball constantly. It's super annoying. Despite having the best title of any volleyball game I've ever seen, it's probably the worst volleyball game I've ever played. This is a miserable game. 3 out of 10. Tempest 2000, 1994, Jaguar. This game is freaking awesome. It's just Tempest with updated graphics and a bunch of cool power-ups, but that's really all you need. There's not much more to say than that, but it's super addictive and a ton of fun. There are even some like awesome flying bonus levels that are like Superman 64, but 
good. <laughs> The only thing I don't like about this game is that your power-ups reset between every stage. I kind of wish you could like perpetually get stronger, but I guess that would mess up the game balance where each stage is based around how fast you can pick up the power-ups and get overpowered. This is probably one of the best games on the entire compilation. It's hard to say, but it's definitely up there at the top. Top three, I'm sure. Nine out of ten. Club Drive, 1994, Jaguar. This is an absolutely atrocious 3D driving game. You're put on one of five open environments and you have to drive around just collecting, uh, what, koosh balls? Remember those koosh balls <laughs> that were around when I was a kid? Whatever, you're collecting those. There's no timer, there's no opponents. You can honestly 100% experience everything this game has to offer in about 20 minutes. It, it really is. It's just more of like a demo than a game. I can't believe this even got released. I don't know what to say about it. Maybe if you could like race against someone to get more koosh balls in a given time period, it would be better. But it doesn't do that. You're just driving around in open world like, ugh. Three out of ten. Super Asteroids and Missile Command, 1995, Lynx. This is the last game released for the Link system, and it's split into two games. I'll cover them separately. First up, Super Asteroids. It plays almost the same as regular Asteroids, except you can pick up these crystals that will give you a spread shot and other upgrades. It certainly helps a lot, but it isn't enough to like elevate the game over regular Asteroids. And at times it feels like even a little slower and worse. I don't know how I feel about this one. In a way it's improved, and I guess in a way it's not as much fun. It's hard to say. I would give it a six out of 10. Super Missile Command, on the other hand, is so much better than regular Missile Command. After each level, you spend this money that you earn to upgrade your turrets, and this can make you like a force to be reckoned with. Not only that, but this is like the best controlling version of Missile Command on the compilation so far. I think it's really good and it's kind of like a standout game on the links, at least of all the ones we've played. 7 out of 10. Ruiner Pinball, 1995, Jaguar. I've played this game a lot in the past, I own it on the Jaguar. There are only two tables in this game. The first table is a Cold War theme with, with like missiles as your flippers. It has a strong 1960s missile crisis feel and there are two play fields side by side and you're able to like shoot your ball back and forth between them as you try to reach DEFCON 5. The second and better table is fantasy themed and has a strong like hell focus. <laughs> There's this buxom witch that you're trying to get her to cast three spells by hitting various objectives on the play field. Overall, the themes and settings of the tables in this game are what make it stand out. The gameplay is pretty mediocre and zoomed in too much, which makes it kind of like hard to follow the ball and the action that's going on on the table. I have to say the game looks like it would be fine on the Sega Genesis because it doesn't push the capabilities of the Jaguar at all. It's considered by many to be one of the best games on the system, and that might be true, but that isn't anything to brag about. <laughs> it's not a great game. 6 out of 10. Missile Command 3D, 1995. Jaguar. This game is exactly as its title describes it. It's just Missile Command in 3D. Despite the fact that we've added a third dimension this time around, this is by far the hardest to control and the least fun version of the game on the entire compilation. You basically have several turrets that are mapped to the various buttons on the Jaguar and you're trying to shoot down crap from the sky. It's just like Missile Command, just harder to control and harder to follow things. And honestly, I think it's less appealing looking despite the fact that it has like better and quote unquote 3D graphics. There's also this underwater turret mode that's a little bit better, but not much. This was going to work with the virtual reality goggles that were supposed to come out for the Jaguar, but just never came out. Who's to say if they would make the game better or not? I can't imagine that they would. This game's pretty terrible. I'm not sure that goggles <laughs> that are uncomfortable with like low resolution would have made it much better. Four out of 10. Atari Karts, 1995, Jaguar. This is the notoriously expensive and notoriously bad kart racer on this system. 
every game during this era had to have a kart racer, and the Jaguar was no exception. Firstly, the game has this like strange perspective that looks like you're playing it while looking through like a bottle of oil. It controls like garbage and touching anything will send you bouncing all over the place or just getting stuck in place, both of which are infuriating. The tracks are all mercifully short, but are still incredibly boring and uninspired. They're nothing to look at, and they're just, oh, oh, just look at it. <laughs> there are no weapons, and the power-ups seem to like practically do nothing. I, I, I don't know if I wasn't activating them or if they just don't do anything, but as far as I know, I mean, I read the instructions. They just don't do much. Honestly, this might be like the worst kart racer of all time. It's certainly the worst one I've ever played, and I hated my time with this. I thought about buying this game physically at a convention like a year ago, and it was $400, and I was right on the verge of doing it, and I'm so glad I didn't. 3 out of 10. Fight for Life, 1996, Jaguar. This is the final game Atari made for the Jaguar. And I know how everyone says that Shaq Fu is like the worst fighting game ever, well, let me tell you this. This game is way, 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 way worse than that. It's supposed to be like Sega's Virtua Fighter, but it just it doesn't work. I don't know what else to say. I'm not exaggerating when I say that this is the slowest, ugliest, most tedious, clunkiest, and most just boring fighting game I have ever played. The very first match of this game, I went 2-0. My opponent did not win a single time, and it took over five freaking minutes. That's completely unacceptable. Everybody's too tanky. All the moves are too slow and sluggish. It's hard to pull them off. This is just a miserable game. I also own it physically on the Jaguar, and wish I didn't. Two out of ten. Race 500, a.k.a. Indy 500. 1977, 2600. Alright guys, this is the final game of the compilation. You unlock it by getting 100% in all of the game's timelines. This is like the racing version of Combat, which was the first Atari 2600 game we covered. There are different modes where you drive around, time trials, you know, how many pellets can you collect in a given time. And if you can get a second player, it's just a good old fashioned race. It's a fine game. But it feels kind of like a strange choice for the final unlockable game of the system. I think they could have gone with something better. 5 out of 10. So after all of that, is Atari 50 the anniversary celebration the best compilation of all time? It's hard to say. I think that the way Digital Eclipse put this all together with the extra features and everything is a step forward in the way people are going to do compilations, and I think that is the best I've ever seen. However, I will say, towards the end of that, there was less and less articles, less interviews, things like that. It just kind of petered out. For the beginning of it, when they were in the 80s, the early 80s and stuff, there's a lot of information and cool insight. But after that, there's just not, they just don't say much. There's just not much more, so you're just left with the games. And the games are really what make and break a compilation. And these 104 games, if you average together all the reviews, they come out to a 5 out of 10. Like perfectly just average, mediocre. There's a lot of stinkers on there. And there's a lot of games that repeat. Like how many times did we go through Asteroids? I have no idea. It feels like half the games on here are Asteroids or Missile Command. And they kind of are. So I don't think that the quality of the games on this compilation is anything to write home about. There are plenty of Atari compilations that are just as good as this, but the way it's all packaged together, especially at the beginning, is unparalleled. It's the best I've ever seen. It does kind of peter out, like I said, but overall, I would say the Atari 50th anniversary celebration is an eight out of 10. Still fantastic. You need to play it. Even the bad games are worth playing to experience the history. But you probably won't have that much fun with them. <laughs> if you made it this far, guys, I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed the content, please like the video, subscribe, leave a comment. All that really helps the channel. And I love the interaction with everyone. And if you really, really enjoyed the content, consider becoming a channel member. There's a lot of cool benefits. You get access to all the videos early before they come out. 
You get access to me, direct messaging via social media. Also, if you want to get your name read out at the end of a video or listed at the end of the video, or if you want to sponsor a segment, or if you really want to be a high roller and pick a game from my huge backlog of over 1,200 games and have me review it and then dedicate the episode to you, all those options are available to you. Once again, guys, I really appreciate all the support, and I'll catch you next time.